Hello everyone, this is Jan Todd. I'll be your instructor for the next uh, 15 modules, 15 weeks, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, being together over this semester learning about sociology. I'm not sure how many of you have ever taken a sociology class before, if you've had one in high school or in some other setting, but what I hope by the end of this semester you learn is how to use the sociological imagination and to apply that to whatever uh, career you have in mind because we can use this discipline in many contexts. Understanding how groups and individuals and society is constructed is key to being a good leader and a good um, person of um, what I would call academic uh, understanding for, for what you're looking at. No matter what, you continue to learn with sociology and it helps stretch your mind in, in the field that you've chosen. So let's get started. This is our first module, what is sociology? And we must start with the person who coined the phrase, the sociological imagination, C. Wright Mills. And he quoted us in the mid fifties as one of our uh, early sociologists that neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both. And that's what we're basically going to do is you have a socialized context, things you've learned over time, ways in which your worldview has been shaped. And in turn, individuals over time and in groups shape society, construct what we believe to be true. And what we believe is how things should run. And if things need to be changed, we change them. It's not something um, other entities can do quite the same way. Animals can change things by maybe working in migration patterns, that type of thing. But to cognitively think about it like we do as humans is something unique. So what is sociology? I want you to think about that for a second. Look at the word itself and know that, yes, it involves being social. And it's not something um, that we do uh, by ourselves, although many would say that we are constructed by many people. We are never by ourselves. Um, we make decisions based on what people have taught us is wrong or right. We make uh, preferences in life, sometimes based on what we're familiar with, our culture. Sometimes our religion dictates something about what we'll do or if we're non-religious. So these are things that sociology is all wrapped up in, and we ask the questions about these formative um, ideas and how society as a whole is constructed. The textbook says it's the scientific study of human social life, groups, and societies, and that's what we're going to do. It's not something that you just think about. It's something that you practice through scientific uh, observation, and we'll learn a little bit about how that method is used in our uh, several uh, beginning weeks here, um, we'll be talking about that theory and that method. It's also a study of people in groups. So it's important as we look through this whole entire um, concept or idea of, of what we're, we're really observing is that we study people in groups um, to see how, because they have a, a larger context of, of shaping things or more power to do so typically, but we also find ourselves born into groups, um, sometimes by location of our birth, um, in the study of what that does and how we are associated with these groups, even before we have the agency to make a difference in our idea of what we want to be a part of. And that typically happens in about this stage. Um, young adulthood is when you typically are uh, able to make more choices, but by this time, you've often had a lot of those decisions made for you. Sociology also gives us the tools to understand social phenomena all over the world. For example, why do we separate ourselves by race and segregate ourselves often? Why is it that we determine that certain ethnic traits are uh, ones that for some reason have more power and um, even though we may have the best intentions, we see the statistics continue to tell us about those differences. Um, what is the phenomena of being in the southern part of the hemisphere where we have the largest amount of people, but we have the less 
uh, least amount of income. And so there's these types of things that we ask questions that are just huge. And uh, this gives us the tools to be able to put that together and at least construct some way in which to study and look at those groups and look at that phenomena. Sometimes it helps us understand why and how we are as individuals. So even though I said it's about being in groups, you're going to find yourself aware or becoming more aware of how things have been shaped for you, how you were socialized as a child or by communities. Um, and that is a, an important part of sociology because for one, when we're making these um, discoveries, we recognize our own bias and maybe sometimes struggle uh, with what we're looking at because of that bias. And then we learn also how to maybe set that bias aside so we can look clearly at what's going on um, and be able to use statistics and data in a way and also overall observation in a way that we can try to remove ourselves from that bias and see what we think is scientifically going on. There are many groups that we can study. For example, um, when I talk about a group, a lot of times people tend to, to make big mega groups. You know, I wanna study women, or I wanna study um, children. Um, these are great, except for the fact that we have so many different types of people that are in that category, that sociology invites you to really look at a little bit more of a microcosm. Your final project will be about the Emporia State community. And the reason I do that is to try to limit the scope so that we can try to understand a particular area and understand the region and it gives us a picture of, of boundaries that we need. The same is true when we're talking about whatever it is that we're studying. Um, for example, there's a difference between studying women and women who stay at home in Canada compared to women who work. It gives a specific country, it gives a specific type of activity. Sure, it's a broad subject, but you can tell that that is distinctive and not trying to compare all women who have worked and all women who don't work in the entire global society. So that's one idea. You can narrow it even more and look at something like boys growing up in gang territories of LA. Now LA is huge, but there may be different territories that you could study or a particular territory where maybe there's different borders where gang territories overlap. Um, and what does that do to boys in particular? You wouldn't be studying girls. You wouldn't be studying young children. You'd be studying groups that would be probably in a category of young men that have not yet reached full puberty. And then you can think about something that might be a little rare. Um, even though there are Catholics in Japan, there aren't a lot of Catholics in Japan. So you can take something like a large subject, Catholicism or a country, Japan but recognize that there may be some intersections where there's a particular way of life that you wanna study. And that's the beauty of sociology. You can make up a lot of these intersections and usually find some sort of group to understand. You can come up with a few of your own as you're thinking through uh, and listening to this. Sociology also helps us understand how we as individuals act, react, and interact with our culture and our society. This is another C. Wright Mills uh, translation at least or an idea that we translate our private problems into public issues. So for example, you may be a person that is struggling with uh, debt already as you're heading into college or in college and have been in college for a while and you recognize the pressure individually on that. Now the interesting thing is right now we are in a massive cultural shift where many people are um, basically foregoing things like marriage, owning homes, trying to do anything that puts them in more debt because of their school debt. That then becomes a not private problem, even though it affects you privately, but a public problem because we have so many people doing that. So it's important for us to recognize that our personal problems might be something other people are going through. And what's the idea behind that? What's causing that is something that we will pay attention to. We've got a couple of videos, by the way, later on in the semester that deal a little bit more with that. We also see that when many individuals act and respond in the same way, for example, when groups start to take on identity in mass, that they're likely 
to become social and political forces that shape decision making. And so there may be times where you're part of a larger group. For example, when we're in election year like we are, you'll start to see people polarize a little bit more into their groups. Now, it's not a perfect split. Never is it 50-50. In fact, there are a lot of times lots of subgroups that affect the overall uh, outcome of the larger group. So this is something to keep in mind that when you're part of a larger group, you may find yourself starting to polarize into the ideas of the group, even though you may not think about them on an everyday basis. And especially when there's times where power is being shifted, that you're going to be thinking about decisions um, about how your individual choice might make a difference on a larger scale because you're part of a larger group. We also experience life in a limited way. So there's a lot of times where there are major problems. I don't know if you've ever listened to the news or seen something on a social media site or even gone to Reddit and just seen all the stuff that people are posting that often is just so overwhelming that you just can't deal with every problem that's going on. Most of us experience life in a limited way. And so when we have this uh, use of sociology, we can look at it without being overwhelmed. We also can recognize that everyone experiences life in a limited way. And so um, we have to recognize that each person is shaped by their family, by their country of origin, by the state or their school, by their gender or how they sexually identify, by how they identify by either being labeled a race or accepting or taking on a term of race or ethnicity, by the level of age that they've reached and the way in which society looks at that age. These are all things that we often don't have much control over and every single person on the planet has something going on with this. So it helps us to experience that life and recognize ourselves in that, but then it also helps us to take on the responsibility of uh, identifying that when we start to look at groups and, and that once again helps with our bias. We eventually become aware of other individuals, cultures, places, and peoples whose customs and ways of life do differ from our own. And that is really the fun thing about sociology. You start to really think about not just your own way of looking at life, but you have your opportunity to really stretch the imagination and really think, what is it like to be a person who was raised maybe in the Middle East or was raised in um, a particular setting in urban or rural cultures? Things that are different than what you're used to are challenged and, and asked to be thought about in this uh, discipline. This awareness, once again, leads us to consider the sociological imagination. So what is that? It means in a short sentence, <laughs> the application of imaginative thought to the asking and answering of sociological questions. Let's look at that. The application meaning I'm going to choose to imagine, <laughs> to think about asking those questions, not based on what I'm choosing, not based on how I might even choose things, but based on what I'm seeing and thinking and observing. And in doing that, I wanna ask some questions. For example, um, why certain people might vote the way they do? Um, is there something behind the reasons for that voting pattern? Is it something that happens to have uh, roots in the family? Has it got roots in some ways economic life or social class? Does it have roots with region or origin of birth? These are all kinds of things that we start to ask and that imagination starts to stir. Why is this going on? Someone who uses the sociological imagination thinks of him or herself or they away from the familiar routines of everyday life. Um, they think of themselves not in their typical everyday situation, but take time to think about bigger situations and bigger reasons for them. Sociology also challenges us to leave the familiar behind and delve into the inner workings of our society. These questions help us to imagine. So that's something that I, I think uh, we are challenged to do in all of our classes when we are going through our formal education. 
And when you're working on undergraduate and graduate work, um, a lot of times you get to make space for these questions. And this happens, you know, in philosophy, happens in biology. So as a science, which sociology is, we ask those same questions. And these are the typical ones we would look at. Why are we the way we are? Why do we act the way we do? Why do we choose the way we choose? Why do we believe what we believe? We'll look at a lot of these throughout. Also, there's a sense of deeming good, natural, and inevitable that has been streamlined into our life by all those outside influences and social forces, whether it be historical, knowing that we're, for example, born in the United States, typically if we're in the, at Emporia State, but not always. There are many uh, international students or people who have born, been born outside the US. But there's a clear distinction about how we would see good, natural, and inevitable based on what our society says and, and tries to influence. Um, whereas those same terms, good, natural, and inevitable, might be something totally different if you're in another part of the world um, and have a different system socializing you. So we go into what we say is understanding the subtle yet complex and profound ways in which our individual lives reflect the context of our social experience. I'm gonna say that again. It's understanding the subtle. So it's something simple. For example, wearing jeans. Um, I often say people, wear jeans for different reasons. Some people wear jeans because it's comfortable. Some wear them because it's for work. Some people wear them to go to a club and some people absolutely don't wear jeans at all. Understanding something like that as to why somebody might wear the piece of clothing they're wearing is subtle, but it can be complex as well because there may be a lot of things going in behind that. For example, why is it that it really costs only $15 to make any jean, any set of jeans across the entire board to put the threads together, to be able to produce it, and yet we can see such a huge difference in what people will pay for a pair of jeans. For example, look at the last pair of jeans that you did buy. How much did you spend on them? Have you seen jeans that have been more or less? Does that give you a certain status by having a certain type of jean? Jeans are something that may not seem like that big of a deal, but when you really look at the whole idea of them, that subtlety comes through as well does the, as does the complexity that society has put such a difference and variance on the price of a pair of jeans. And this makes a profound difference in our individual lives because it reflects the context of one, how we pay people, two, what we see as status or a status symbol, and our experience of how we just look at a pair of jeans that, uh, that we may put on on a regular basis and not even think about it. That's the central tenet of sociology, that subtlety and that complexity that we look at. So how can we learn to think sociologically? Our sociological imagination allows us to see that many events that seem to concern only individuals actually reflect global concerns. That things that you think are personal to you are actually something that other groups are thinking about or even people that you're close to. And that as you continue to act and react to those concerns, that that might make an impact on how we do life, how we shape life, and what we deem to be the norm of what we call normal in life. We'll talk more about that in the next section. C. Wright Mills also further defines the sociological imagination by breaking it into two categories, those personal troubles and social issues. Again, those personal troubles, for example, like divorce, where you go to school and you get your best, best or like divorce or where you should go to school and get your best education. These are individual things that sometimes people come up against. If a person's divorcing another person or they're going through that process, it may seem like only two people are involved in that decision. However, as you start to see people who are involved, how life is shaped once the couple has decided to divorce and how different economic paths are created, those personal troubles become sometimes a larger issue. Where you go to school to get the best education? That's a big question with a lot of people in school debt. 
And sometimes best is determined by somebody that might give it a high ranking. But I think Emporia State's a pretty amazing place to get an education. And it doesn't cost as much as many schools do that have that ranking. There's a lot of these types of things that look like personal troubles, but really it might be pointing us to that larger social issue. The big issues like racism or things like obesity, poverty, our health, our education, how we pay for things in life, what's considered a, a sense of um, self-worth and, and, and understanding how people can find that sense of happiness, um, the definition of happiness, understanding uh, the differences in um, inequality based on gender or based on people's identity, whether it be uh, sexual identity or gender identity. These are all things that are huge on that social scale. And so C. Wright Mills once again reminds us that we're breaking that into these two areas, but they intersect constantly on a regular basis. At its core, sociology is about the construction of meaning. When we look at any form of sociology, whether, for example, I've taught sociology of religion this summer, or whether we're looking at sociology of education or sociology of business, these are all things that we've constructed. Humans have made them. They've been built just as much as a building has been built. And there's a lot of times, a lot of blocks that over time will wear away and there's different meaning that we have to find for what we're gonna do with it next. Every action is symbolic and every action has meaning. And so don't take this lightly. This isn't something that we just say, oh, well, I just think people are like that. Well, we could do that on our everyday basis, but when we're talking about social science, which we are, then we need to make sure to back that up with some data and really look at the bigger picture, not just our own opinion. So I want you to take a moment. And this is the first exercise I typically have most classes do when I'm in their presence. Take a piece of your clothing or find a piece of clothing in your closet and think about it in a sociological way. Who made that? How would you describe it? Where has that clothing been? How many hands do you think it took to make the material? And look at the types of material. If there's any synthetic material in it, that actually came from the earth, probably through some form of petroleum or it was cotton and it was grown in a farm. Was it something that had pesticides or was it something that was organic? Is it something that had material constructed in India but it was assembled in Mexico? How far did that travel? Did anything indicate that this was um, worth more based on its construction or based on how the label uh, reflects status? All of these things just in a little piece of clothing might be something that give you a, a sense of what we're really talking about here. Now I dare you to go through your whole closet and try to see the whole world based on how many people have touched, made, and contributed to your entire closet. That's what we're doing when we talk about sociology. It's the social construction, which is an idea or a practice that a group of people agree exists. Making clothing, buying clothing, wearing clothing, it exists. And it's maintained over time by people taking its existence for granted. We don't think about clothing, let alone the carpet, let alone the automobiles, let alone the very nature in which we take these things from. So that's what I want you to be invited to look at, is the so social construction of society and how we play a part in that. Help me think of some forms of social construction in your own brain right now, take a moment or two. What are some of the things, if you look around the room in which you're in, you notice some of the things that are constructed? And then think about the people behind them. And then think about the social situations that might behind that, be behind that as well. This is all part of also something that we call socialization. We get used to things. And we get used to things as normal. The social processes, especially with children, as they develop awareness of social norms, what we call normal, values, and achieve that distinct sense of self, that's also what we're talking about. That we look at social constructions as if there's something to be taken for granted, and as if there's something that are normal because we were taught that way. That's something that not only have we taught or been taught, but we teach others. And if you choose to have children later on, you'll probably do the same thing. 
So who, who helped us with the discipline of sociology? There are some folks here that we need to think about. Um, you're going to hear these three names especially, but there are other folks that are involved. And in your reading this week, I invite you to go a little deeper with these uh, founders. But Emil Durkheim, Mark, Karl Marx, and Max Weber tend to be what we call the old dead white founders, <laughs> meaning they in the late 1800s and early 1900s helped us shape some of this discipline because people were interested, especially after the Industrial Revolution, as to how societies were formed and especially in reaction to capitalism. A few things about these uh, folks. Emil Durkheim uh, is a, uh, our basic sociologist that helped us with quantifying the research about how we record actions of people in order to study correlation, meaning things that cause other things to happen, and causality, meaning things that are related and things that are, are being caused. He's often known for other terms such as organic solidarity, social constraint, anime, functionality of society. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Durkheim also asked the fundamental question when he was thinking like a sociologist. His big question was, what holds society together? Often this is quoted as, what glues us together? Why do we stay together when we stay together? And why do we break apart when we break apart? This led to his concern with the division of labor, for example, at the macro level and the ritual at the micro level, meaning how we do our labor and what makes sense when we are all working together and then when it breaks apart, what's going on, especially at the micro level. Karl Marx was a materialist, um, in meaning he looked at capitalism as this form of materialism that has come to such a, a constraint that all of us have become material ourselves. And so his materialist conception of history, I shouldn't say he's a materialist, but he would say all of us are or have become. Based on the conflict of the rich and the poor always basically being in struggle with each other, conflict theory is something that is often attributed to Karl Marx. Now, a lot of times people will assume that he is associated with communism. And yes, many communist countries have taken some of the ideas of Marx and tried to put that into socialism. But he is much more of a thinker, historian, sociologist, philosopher, economist, and has contributed greatly. And many of the things that he has talked about, especially when it comes to social inequality and how we divide labor and what we value, is very true today. And a lot of us take into mind that his theory really helps us to think about conflict and especially inequality. He especially looked at things like means of production, meaning how we put things together. He also looked at socioeconomic class distinctions and struggle. Why do we have so many different classes and why does one group tend to have more wealth and power than other groups? So Mark's question would have been, why history? Why did we shape things the way we did? Why did we make this thing historical? The big question led to his investigation of the origin of the nature of capitalism, the economic aspect of historical change in the modern world, and that's the world which we typically look at right now. And we're seeing some changes in capitalism. There can either be strong extremes of super hyper capitalism, which we call sometimes adventure capitalism and or venture capitalism. But then there's other forms that are more social um, that are trying to form people's choice around things that are more socialized. That's just what capitalism is doing, let alone what socialism would uh, alone, you know, other types of form of governments that we've seen um, that are basically blending capitalism sometimes with the state-driven uh, models. And we'll talk a little bit about that later too. But all of these things are something that Marx looked back at and said, why did we choose to do this this way with our labor and with our value? Max Weber is also somebody that uh, is well known. He lived up into the 20s, 1920s. He had come to the United States, but he was from Germany. And he had known also Durkheim. Weber did not uh, know Marx, nor did um, Durkheim, but the Durkheim and, and Weber were, were able to be in the same social groups. Um, Max Weber really did a lot about studying how we do religion um, and the spirit of capitalism, especially when it came to Protestants. 
and this new Protestant work ethic. And I don't want to go into deep detail, but one thing he did study was how the nature of a religious group and the practices and rituals of that religious group can shape certain things outside that religious group, especially how we labor and how we value things. And in turn, that can of often lead into our current idea of what we develop and the importance of development um, based on working hard and making life progressive or forward, any of those types of terms Weber would have looked at. And he said, we basically rationalized our progress uh, because we saw it as a form of our own value and especially uh, stemming from that Protestant ethic where there were many um, people who, uh, after breaking from the Catholic church, were in charge of their own salvation. And so they weren't sure about what was gonna happen, um, whether they, they would be saved or not. And therefore, they became very hard workers because they wanted to prove to this higher being that they uh, were worth something and that not basically idle hands um, create idle minds, all those kinds of things. They didn't, they absolutely saw labor as a way to avoid any temptation or um, any sense of being idle. And in his study of that, he said, it rationalized their hard work. And in turn, what that did is they became very rich and they became very wealthy and they had a large portion of, um, a, a short amount of time, a large portion of wealth that eventually, once they broke away from that kind of Protestant fear, um, turned into something that we now call capitalism today. And I can't go into that all t in detail, but that gives you some of the idea of the theory. They were asked two questions. Why did modern social order arise in Western Europe rather than somebody somewhere else? There's a lot of sociologists that will say it did rise other places. We just have not recognized that from the Western perspective. And he led to the study of world religions and medieval cities and the role of the state. And why do people do what they're told, especially from bureaucracy and any form of authority? There are other voices that are part of this entire group um, other than the old dead white guys. Harriet Martinow, which there's a video on her and also W.E.B. Du Bois, and also I want you to watch the video on the three types of theory, um, and we'll, we'll do that next week as well. But Harriet Martinow uh, helps us to study society uh, with the key idea that women are sometimes forgotten and seen as second-class citizens, and that we see this in our political, religious, and social institutions. And she said, if we must study society, we must study how society looks at females, and especially how their power and agency is um, respected or not. And so she is one of our great sociologists. One of her great quotes was that, you know, the difference between uh, women and a horse is that you know, the man will often, you know, feed the horse, but the same amount of horsepower is being used by a female and she's in charge of feeding herself. And there, there's all kinds of little things and quips she makes. Um, from the time she lived in the late 1800s, um, she was one of the major people that helped us to um, basically gain the right to vote. So um, read about her also in the text. And the W. Du Bois, she's one of my favorites. He had the idea of not only looking at society based on whether um, a person is in a certain class, but that sense of living a double life. Um, he saw himself as a well-educated man. Um, he is a well-educated man, two undergraduates, one PhD, and had taught at two of our greatest schools in the time of the Reconstruction. But he often said, a man that is uh, Black, African did not see themselves just as a man, but had to also see their race, whereas those who were in power, who typically were white, did not have to see that. They just saw themselves as a person. And in that, he helped us to see that all of us might have ideas of double consciousness at some point, especially those of um, lower status, lower power, and that life lived through one's own eyes uh, is often valued by others, and we don't get to choose that value. So the problem with social economic hardships on people um, who are not equally valued is in need of social reform, that 
we are not valuing everybody and we use a lot of times um, outside physical or historical or um, different segregated ideas of power and who deserves to have that power as one of our ways of identifying and then therefore people 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 have to deal with their own um, segregated way of living in life so if you're female you can't just say I'm a human you have to say I have a human female but a lot of times um, the, the maleness is not necessarily recorded at the same level and that's not to try to once again point one way or another it's just a sense of our own understanding of the dualicity of our lives all of these theorists share a common goal to explain social change and to generalize the concern in the in to question all the answers that we have is something that that we are called to do and, and that um, we are trying to explain things here um, and we don't just find an end to the explanation because people change but we can typically get a good scope of things for a while and then predict some ideas of where things are going um, all of these did this with understanding culture social structure what's going on globally um, but we'll learn more about that as well. So that is the end of the presentation for today. Um, but what we do want to keep in mind is that we are people that are continually learning. Um, please pay attention to your discussions this week. And uh, thank you again for your attention. I hope you enjoy uh, all the other things you get to learn this week. And I look forward to your posts. <laughs>